Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is going to be Alien Romulus, my review. Now, this is just going to be a, a kind of off the cuff, no script involved, my thoughts, my feelings. Um, by now, if you're an Alien fan, you've probably already seen Alien Romulus. Um, it's been praised universally, um, but really, it's an okay film. Uh, there's a lot of key jangling. There's a lot of nostalgia bait. There's a lot of references to um, past films, but we'll get into that. This will be a spoiler review, so if you haven't already seen this, um, then maybe go see the film and then come back. And yeah, we're going to get right into it. So this is a sequel to Alien and a prequel to Aliens. It's Alien 1.5. It's kind of the timeline of this. The events go down in between the events of Alien and Aliens. Uh, we start on this kind of rock planet where Rain, this orphan, is working for Wayland Dutani. And she's she's done her hours. She's done the a quota amount of hours that she has to get off this rock. Um, she has a, a brother, um, Andy, uh, played by David Johnson. And yeah, she goes to the Wayland Dutani exec and says, "Hey, I've done my hour. I'm punching out. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm putting the clock out." And they're like, nee, "Well, you know, the thing is, uh, we've got to do more hours. You, you've got another couple of years to be on this planet." So. She essentially meets up with her ex-boyfriend Taylor and a, a group of ragtag ne'er-do-wells uh, on this planet, and they go, yeah, fuck it, we're, we're getting off this rock. Um, we've got this sort of mining shuttle, we'll go up, we've seen, we've discovered this space station, um, and we're going to use the cryopods in that. We're going to take the cryopods um, from the Romulus space station. We're going to put it into our uh, our own ship. And then we're just going to sail off into the distance and for new worlds. They only really take Rain with them because they need Andy, her brother, the synthetic, because he can patch into the Wayland yutani uh, mother. Um, so he'll be able to kind of get access to certain parts of the space station. So off they go, um, and yeah, things soon start going bad. That's the non-spoiler uh, effect of this. Now, what I really found interesting uh, about this film was that uh, Fede Alvarez, the director, he seems to have got into his kitchen, and he's sitting there in his, in his kitchen, in his apron, and he's got this pot, he's got this cauldron, and he's going, hmm, what I'll do is I'll take a little bit of Alien, uh, with uh, cameo characters that will be appearing. That we'll come to that in a bit. Uh, I'm going to take the um, the pulse rifle action stuff of aliens, uh, and then a little, a little sprinkle of Prometheus here. We're going to we're going to bring in the Black Ooze again, and also Alien Resurrection. We're going to have the newborn type of baby thing. We're going to throw that in, and just as a as a little money shot thing, we'll have the comparison with Alien Three, where the alien comes down and you know sits next to. The face of Sigourney Weaver. Yeah, it's it's pretty a hodgepodge of all the films that have come before this. Um, initially, I was skeptical. I was cautiously skeptical when I first found out about Romulus because of the fact that Alvarez did say that this was going to be a throwback. Uh, it's going to be more of a slasher film, like Teenagers in Peril. And the thing about that is that the original 1979 Alien film was a B movie horror, house horror in space. Uh, it was just kind of upped by the aesthetics, the set designs, the sound, the characters. And it surpassed that B-movie status into kind of the, the cult phenomenon that it is now. So I was skeptical that they were going back to this kind of slasher roots. And you, one could argue that even Alien is having, you know, characters picked off one by one by this um, perfect organism. And what Alvarez does very well in the first half of this film is set up tension. There's a lot of tension building. If you've seen Don't Breathe, uh, one of his previous films, then you'll basically get the same thing here. It's essentially the same type of film. It's a group of kids that bust into a place they're not meant to be, and then you have this stalking uh, antagonist that's after them. Stephen Lang's character is the blind man in Don't Breathe. This is essentially the same thing. So if you've seen Don't Breathe, it is kind of the same film in that respect. Now I'm going to focus on the pros because the design of the Romulus station, it's actually Romulus and Remus. There's, there's two parts of this actual station. They just think it's a derelict ship. And when they get up there, they find out that actually, no, this is a, a space station, a research station uh, that's kind of set in two halves. One is Romulus and Remus. If you know your mythology, you'll know they were the kind of brothers who founded Rome, essentially. 
that's not really explored in this the the kind of mythology of that it, i think there's like a throwaway line when they first get on board the the mother computer generated ai voice says turns around and says something some kind of off the cuff line about that but overall you're not going to really know much about that they basically get up there um they split into two teams one is andy taylor and for the life of me couldn't remember this other guy's name he has this kind of like little wispy mustache and a bandana i, I found out later that his name is bjorn but uh for the i couldn't even hear his name being called out anyway they go on board and they get trapped um because they find the live pods quite easily but there's no cryofuel they need cryofuel uh, for their six-year destination so they need to kind of find more fuel they go into this kind of uh, specialist area where they get trapped because the door closes on them so then rain and uh, navarro who's the pilot um has to they have to come on board now this is the part of the film where i think we'll derive a little bit of contention from a lot of people because they find another android on board yeah this is ash um not ash rook um taking the kind of play of name of bishop in aliens they've gone for another chess piece uh called rook who's kind of half decimated much like bishop at the end of aliens he's kind of torn asunder they basically discover that um the nostromo ship from the original film hadn't been obliterated um from the the, the thermonuclear power of the self-destruct mechanism on that ship what they basically find is that um a Wayland yutani salvage crew 20 odd years 30 odd years later after the events of the first film go off into deep space to find parts of the nostromo ship and what they've done is they found a kind of fossil they found this kind of asteroid rock where they extract uh, the original alien so the original big chappy alien they don't really go into much detail about the fact that the original big chappy alien that ripley blew out of the airlock in the in the escape shuttle from the first film has been what just floating around in space and has become fossilized i'm not a scientist i don't know how this works i don't know if that would be even a thing but let's just go with it suspension of disbelief let's just say that yeah okay they found the original alien from the nostromo they've opened it up apparently like in the thing it's come back to life and it's just caused mayhem and destruction on the romulus station now the only way reason we know this is because it's kind of hanging from it's obviously been shot it's obviously been shot at and the acid has bled into the ship and it's kind of fallen through and it's sort of almost suspended in a christ-like figure uh, in this kind of medical research area and you can see this because they've got the still got the harpoon coming out the back of it so the original alien has obviously gone amok has caused mayhem and yeah we find uh rook who is basically there as a massive exposition dump for the new characters because obviously they don't know we have the foresight of knowing from the franchise from the film what's gone on how the life cycle of the alien how it works but these characters don't know so he basically has to spend about five minutes just dumping all this info on them about the perfect organism about the way it works how it's there etc etc now why i say this will probably cause a lot of contention is because they've done this thing that seems to be now a thing where we'll take you know you have ian home who originally played the character of ash uh who passed away in 2000 and they do the the whole deep fake cgi um look on him and when i originally saw this it seems like at the start of the like when he's first introduced it seems really weird because it looks quite janky it's got that uncanny valley effect the eyes are kind of darting around the mouth even now even uh, i mean the most recent one i can think of is the indiana jones um and they did that pretty well but it, there's still that uncanny value. It, it kind of takes you out of the immersion. It takes you out of the moment. Whenever I see, like, have you seen Rogue One with Carrie Fisher? If you've seen, you know, these type of films, there seems to be this growing trend of, you know, taking recently or past deceased actors, um, obviously getting sign off from their estate and being allowed to do this. And yeah, it just looks weird. It looks quite janky. As the film goes on, it seems to improve because Rook is actually quite an integral part of this whole plot. He's there 
he's basically saying he's at first you don't know whether he's going to be a good guy or is he going to be like ash in the original is he manipulating these kind of characters and yeah he's obviously giving them advice he's sort of saying to them this is how you can get out um but also at the same time you know that there's going to be inner machinations going on you know that he's going to have uh, ulterior motives in this so basically rain and navarro get on board rain has the idea of taking the module chip out of rook's head and giving that to andy because andy so far is malfunctioning like when we're first introduced to him he's just delivering puns that's basically his his prime directive is to protect rain so rain's father before he died um got this robot from somewhere like a scrap heap um repurposed andy to just basically be rain's protector and that's his prime directive um, but he's obviously malfunctioning the years have gone on um, the years have not been kind to andy and he's acting like a kind of younger brother like a kind of five he has the kind of innocence of a five-year-old child um in the in the body of a, a human m adult male so he's just there to kind of obviously humor rain and give her quips and let her know that she's safe but he's not particularly effective um as an android so with the science officer rook's module upgrade uh andy becomes this newfangled machine and i've got to give props to um the the actor because in any kind of film where you have to dual role things where one's like a really innocent childlike being then becoming this very no-nonsense pragmatic um android yeah uh, he's got a big future ahead of him um and I'm, I'm looking forward to see what he does next because he was one of the shining examples of the characters in this film is he there to save them is he the, is he there to s serve Wayland yutani they play around a little bit with his um directives with his designations and that's quite good um yeah so then things go mock because in the room where taylor and Bjorn and Andy are in um the temperature since they've released the cryo fuel the temperature starts rising and all these face huggers that are in there start to uh, thaw out essentially and if you've seen the trailer um which I think does give a lot of way in this film then you'll know what happens next the face huggers get loose Navarro gets um impregnated and she runs back to the ship uh, back to the shuttle to leave they need to get the hell out of there so in the midpoint of the film this is where it kind of starts going away from the build-up tension of like alien and becomes more action orientated in the theme of aliens and averas has kind of said from the beginning that he wanted this to be a, a film of two halves one being the kind of tension building um slow build burn of alien and then the second half being aliens um but sometimes you can't have your cake and eat it because there are some decisions that are made that it's a bit iffy, a bit iffy. Um, essentially, it boils down to the fact that, um, yeah, Navarro gets chest bursted, and now you have the the big bad that's on board. And once again, they play around with the life cycle of the alien in this film, which is a little bit jarring for me. In the original film when Kane gets face hugged um it seems to be you know a long time for the incubation of the alien in the chest to the actual forthcoming chest bursting scene maybe even days now this has always been a bit iffy in the timeline of the films um in Aliens vs Predator it seems like this chest burst the, the cycle of it goes through in a couple of mere hours and the same thing happens here um Navarro gets face hugged and literally within half an hour she chest burster comes out so they play around with that a lot but then they also have this scene where the the newly born alien um kind of incubates itself on the wall now i think what they're trying to do here is have a nod reference to the original deleted scene in alien where ripley goes down as she's running away from the ship when she's kind of thrown the switch um for the self-destruct mechanism and she's running back and there's a famous scene where she finds dallas uh being cocooned so they have this kind of fleshy mold thing that i'm just gonna say it looks like a vagina they have this this kind of cocooned area that looks like a big vj and um bjorn <laughs> with oh yeah there's another character i completely forgot called Kay. 
Um, she's not in this film for much. She basically is there at the very beginning. She's pregnant. And she goes, I'm going to stay on, on the ship. Um, you guys go out and do your thing. I'm, I'm just going to sit here and uh, I've got nausea. I'm just going to... And she's in the last part of it as basically cannon fodder. There's a lot of the characters here that are just merely cannon fodder. And I'm a little bit disappointed with that because in the original Alien, even though the characters don't have a lot of lines, you get the kind of sense of who they are. They're these blue-collared working schlubs. They're on this towing vehicle. And... You really get a sense for each of these characters, Brett, Parker, uh, Kane. You really get a sense of who they are. In Romulus, it's just like, hey, you've got this kind of jockey kind of ex-boyfriend guy who's okay. Um, you've got the and uh, passive-aggressive, annoying character. Then you've got Kay who doesn't really do much. She's just pregnant. That's her. That's her arc. She's pregnant. Navarro, who's this tough pilot who doesn't really get to do much because she's one of the first ones to go. Um, it's really focusing on Rain and Andy. They're, that's the, the main emphasis of the characterizations here. And Rain, she's not really given much. She looks, there's a lot of looks, a lot of close-up looks where she's looking anxious, a lot of close-up looks where she's looking angry or upset. But she isn't really given much to do with this. Andy, once again, is another film, another another alien film where the prime character is an android. I don't know when this became a thing. Well, obviously, they do with Prometheus with David, with Michael Fassbender's character. But it, surely we're getting past that point now. Surely we should be looking at human characters rather than synthetic people as the main protagonists, the ones we're meant to empathize with. There's going to be a lot of people that probably are in this and it's like, I don't know who that person is. Uh, I just want to see them how they get killed. So now you have this big, bad alien fee fi fo fumming around the ship. Um, there are some pretty cool scenes. There's one scene in particular where Rain and Andy and Taylor are stuck. Well, they've got to get to this other part of the ship and there's a compartment full of face huggers. So they come up with the idea of raising the temperature to the facehuggers don't smell their pheromones or something like that. that was pretty cool there's another pretty cool section where rain has a prototype pulse rifle and there's anti-grav that's a whole thing in the ship and um she's acting basically like one of the turrets from aliens so there are some pretty cool moments in the film um but then the third act just goes off the rails completely um the the character K who's being preg who's pregnant gets impregnated and um, Rook tells her that the only way to save her is to use the 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 goo the black goo from Prometheus so yeah that's a whole thing compound Z or something like that it's it's a cool in, in Romulus but Rook basically states that what they've been doing on the ship is extracting this the black goo from Covenant and Prometheus and it's it apparently has regenerative capabilities so uh, rook basically tells rain to inject the character but she goes nah, i'm not sure about this something feels a bit icky to me something feels a bit fishy something feels a bit off but she injects herself anyway and gives birth to what can only be described as the newborn like from alien resurrection so there's this humanoid engineer looking creature at the very end that's your your fourth act like a surprise um yeah I, I think a lot of people will will be able to sit on the fence at this point they'll be like yeah i like this i see where this is going or they'll be like well it's been done before and i think ultimately alien romulus is an emulation of everything that's gone before it it's taking a nod here a wink there a tip of the hat over there but it does it so many times that it almost feels safe it's a safe film it's a safe alien film. That's the best way I can describe Romulus. Um, the lo-fi futuristic aesthetic from Alien is still there. Like the set designs are amazing. Um, the sound is great. It once again it riffs off certain other films, Alien and Aliens. Character development isn't so much. We're we're primarily focused on Rain and Andy. There there are two people that we want to get behind as such. Um, but there's there's far too many quips used from the other films as well. Andy says at one point, I prefer the term artificial person myself that Bishop said in Aliens. There's even that moment at the end where he says, get away from her, you bitch. Um, and I, I inwardly groaned. I inwardly groaned when I heard that. I mean, it's come up with your own things. 
I mean, say what you will about Prometheus and the way that Ridley Scott took the direction. Um, I don't need to know about the the genesis of the engineers. I don't want to know about where the space jockeys came from. That's what made Alien so alien. That's what made it so unique, was there's so many things that you don't know about. I don't want to be told about the Boogeyman's past or his origin story. I don't need to know that. Um, I'm looking forward to Alien Earth, um, the TV show that will be coming up, because that's apparently meant to be set more upon the Waylon Jutani uh, executive sort of thing. So I'm hoping that there'll be more kind of Game of Thrones succession style shenanigans at play. Um, but yeah, that's it, really. I mean, it, it, it's a safe film. It's a safe Alien film. Is it good? Sure. Does it borrow heavily from the other films? Yeah. Is that what you want? Maybe. Um, yeah, I mean, out in the scheme of things, in the kind of whole retrospect of the universe, I would put this uh, behind Alien 3 in front of Alien Resurrection. I, you know, a lot of people hate Alien 3. I, if you get the assembly cut, it's a, it's a better film. And yeah, I, I have a place in my heart for it. It's dark, um, but yeah. There's a lot of problems with it, but there's a lot of problems with Romulus. There's a lot of, there's also a lot of um, what what happened here. So, for example, as I explained before about the fossil of the alien, is that a thing? Can 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 aliens fossilize into themselves? I don't know. Um, why did no? Why didn't Whalen Utani know about this derelict space station, a research station that's obviously focusing so much on the alien DNA that surely they would have sent a team out? How does this group of teenagers find it above their their planetoid, and no one else does? Um, that's not really explained. Um, they're obviously setting this up, baiting it up for a sequel. Um, I just hope if they do decide to follow these characters. Um, then hopefully they take it in a new direction. It's not just going to be slashy, pick one off here, pick one off there type scenario. I hope they do something new. But let me know what you thought in the comments below. Um, like or dislike this video. And uh, I'll see you on the next one. Stay ghoulish. Bye.